The way we put things to ourselves is how it will come out. That's, wh that's, why, we're, we, that's why I'm fighting vocabulary here, so that you learn to use terms that will result in what you want it to be. And when you have mis um, terms, it's a miscommunication from you to you, and out comes the wrong thing. I think that people don't realize that the reason, the real reasons why they do things are not reality, but fantasies. Fantasies of what they can become, of what their lives will be, of who they will love, of what kind of children they will have, of what kind of job they want. Everything is a fantasy that they want to make come true. So, to me, fantasies are the greatest and most important part of human beings, not reality. Reality is what keeps pushing us down all the time, and fantasy is the only thing that makes us rise. Communication is largely misunderstood. I, it is my advice to you, and don't stone me, <laughs> is that all of you should go and take one course only from Scientology, no. which is the course in communication. It changed my entire life, <laughs> and all of my teaching is since based on it. And I, when, I, when Milton Katsalas, my dear friend, said, go and take the course, I said, what do I need the course in communication? If there's one thing I can do, it's communicate. So I went and took the course, and I really discovered some of these things. Communication is a two-way street. To send a message to somebody, if you don't get acknowledgment of the message, and a return message, you haven't sent a message. So there has been no communication. Communication is a circle, a sending of a message and a getting a message back. If there's no message back, it is incomplete and nothing has happened. You know how often we say, but I told you that to somebody? How many times do I have to tell you that? Well, they have never duplicated and received the message. They have simply rejected the message. In acting, we want to try always to have a completed cycle of communication. <coughs> and communication requires acknowledging and duplicating the message that we have received from the other person before, in order to answer them. That doesn't take long, it just takes a second. But we must uh, duplicate and acknowledge the message that we receive. You, you did miss the jump in the fourth. <laughs> I, uh, I pioneered the jump in the fourth, Rudy. <laughs> That's my jump. I never miss that jump. You're right, it, it's not so much the jump as as the land, Mickey. Oh. Da 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 and jump! <laughs> it doesn't happen any other way. Mickey. That's the land, Mickey. <laughs> Carl? <coughs> Anything? Um, I thought 
they're uh, they were listening to each other, and they were they were utilizing and and really involving themselves with each other, one another, playing off each other. The thing that you have to remember is that in relationships, what they did was everything the other person did had a consequence in terms of the, of the partner. And we don't know what we're going to do until the person we're partnering with does something that we can react to. And yet people are forever uh, going on and on and on without anything to react to. So that this physicalizing is what is so necessary because it communicates so much more strongly than anything they said. Nothing they said was as strong as anything they did, was it? Another wonderful thing I liked about them that we hadn't seen before was the quality of mischievousness that you were talking about yesterday. They each had their wonderful moments, and you could just see the thought process and the silent dialogue happening, and then these actions that were mischievous and uh, tantalizing. All they did was play straight instead of the games that people play when they are negotiating love terms. Mm -hmm. We all play games. Yeah, it's fun. They don't play straight. People who play straight live alone, <laughs> are left alone, and never get out of the house. Peter? What happens when the dialogue of the other person, when they don't have any dialogue, do you still have that competition going with inner dialogue? There were many times when there was no dialogue going at all, and the competition never stopped, did it? With the actions. Yeah, actions and silent dialogue. I mean, Peter was sending silent dialogue to the back of Stephen, and he was receiving the message. <laughs> when you send it strong enough, there's, you can't deny it. You feel it through your back. People keep thinking that communication only comes out of the mouth and the eyes. It doesn't. It comes out of the whole of the body. And so you communicate with all of you, head to toe, arms, legs, and other private parts. <laughs> <laughs> now, silent dialogue is absolutely essential for screen work. Because unless you are constantly sending messages to the other person, specific silent dialogue messages, your face goes dead and you end up on the cutting room floor. So, and it works on the stage too, but it is absolutely essential for film, because film picks up what messages you are sending. And if you're thinking about the grocery list, it picks that up and you're on the cutting room floor. Competition has become a kind of dirty word. What I mean by competition is healthy competition. You have to compete to get a seat on the subway. You have to compete to get a seat in here. You have to compete to go to the toilet or you do it in your pants. You have to compete to get food. Healthy competition is stimulating. It helps you grow. Bad competition is the kind where Big businesses sm buy out small businesses and then destroy them, etc. But I'm talking about healthy competition. Competition is absolutely essential or a relationship dies. Because competition is a form of stimulating one another and making one another grow. And a, a, a relationship that stands status quo soon atrophies and dies. It's got to keep growing or it loses its value. So keep thinking of competing as a healthy thing. Find the competition in every scene. It's a, again, as somebody said earlier, what we're competing for is I'm right and you're wrong and you should be doing it my way. And the other person is saying the same thing. You're right and I'm wrong. And what the best goal is to compromise, and each gets to do some of each his thing. And marriages that work do that, and marriages that don't, when the competition gets too keen, and I'm right and you're wrong becomes the issue, they go to the divorce court. <laughs>
ta 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 and jump. Oh, it doesn't work, Rudy. It's got to be there. I choreographed the fucking thing, I know it works. Philip? Well, they followed um, the really basic rules of improv. There wasn't any blocking that really happened in terms of, of any one of them denying information given to them. They accepted the information and, and included something else to take the scene even farther. Dean? Um, uh, when you're improving like that, the, uh, the importance of what you're doing, the import importance of the communication is so there because you're depending on each other to survive. And, uh, and I think that's missing in the scenes or uh, not made as important, you know, the, the importance. And because if you don't, it falls flat. And I... But you see, everybody's improvs <laughs> find these things out. And then you don't carry them into the scene because you let the structure of the scene take over instead of the relationship take over. Only you are big enough for that. I love you. <laughs> I love you. Now, leave me. <laughs> I don't want to see you in the bar. Let's put our money together and buy out this shirt and guy. Do you think it's a profitable thing? I think it could work. I think we could do this show together. I think, okay, you can take care of the business and I'll be the artistic director. <laughs> oh, you bitch. <laughs> Kelly? In, in your thinking processes, how did you always manage to come up with something to do? Because you know as soon as you stop, the improv dies. So how is it different when you get through the scene? Same, Same thing. thing. I can't let him beat me either. I, I can't let because him win. Because people don't set up high enough stakes to win. If you have the stakes are high enough and there are consequences to every action, then it will be like this. Important. Uh, you must choose life and death importance for every single scene. Nothing less will do. If you pick, we've gone through this before, like Virginia Woolf. We have these arguments every day. That won't help. It's got to be what's different about today and what threatens my existence. Now, Gail asked me the question, does it have to really be, I'm going to commit suicide if you don't do what I say? No, but it has to have life and death importance. Like, if you don't do this, my life will not be worth living. I'm going to lead a horrible life. I'm going to be sad. Like, I used in, in the improv life and death of his saying, I'm going to go off and become a Buddhist monk and sit on top of a mountain, right? If you don't let me be with her. I never want to be with anybody else. I'm going to go off and be a hermit. So that's a choice. So you, you can make any choice that is applicable to the material you think more so, but it has to have within it that threat that I can't go on with my life. My life will be changed, will be destroyed, will be something else if I don't get what I need from you. So you cannot underestimate the importance there are too many people who, who read scenes and say, well, we do this every day, so we just have this everyday fight and so forth and so forth. That won't work. It will not work. Um, what happens if you're auditioning for a small role, let's say a secretary or something, where she's just saying very ordinary lines like, yes, I'll get that for you, sir, this kind of thing. How can you put an important event to such a tiny little scene? And should you? Well, I think you should. I th it's, uh, have you ever watched Susan Rattan in Law and Order? She has scenes like that. Well, she manages, she's a student of mine, she manages to take a little thing like his saying, uh, 
what's her name? And Susan, uh, take this report. And she looks at this report and she goes, this report you want me to type up? Jesus Christ, this awful report. And you think, what's on that report? So she's made a whole event out of it. And we've never even find out what the importance of that report, but we're fascinated by what she's done with that moment, which is why she's in that show. Because she just has bits and pieces here and there. Once in a while she has a big scene, but usually just bits and pieces. But she makes something out of everything. Like that. She, she like, right away? You want me to type this right away? Oh shit, I have 50 other things to do. Yes, sir. Event. When a person has been real, deep down hurt, like I was by my husband, not only left me, he tore me down every minute we were together, belittling me, telling me that nothing I did was right until I, I come to believe it. When a person gets that hurt, there's a tendency to take it out on the next person who comes along. Yeah, I know that all right. I'm not going to do that to you. I solemn give my word. Thank you. You see any of that coming out of me, you call an immediate halt, you hear? I think I want to kiss you again. I thought you'd never get to it. Uh, I just wanted to comment, you were talking about states, and I also wondered if, if possibly uh, more pain in the scene would have elevated uh, the stakes and... Uh, the third scene? Humor. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think that's... Very accurate, yes. Um, example, her description of being locked in her house for a year, of, of her husband leaving her. I think she should have made him feel what that had done to her, so that he has all this distrust to break down. Right. I thought you were too easy to get. Right. Right. And although you are fascinated at once, he has to overcome this for you. No, no, no. We're not talking about fault. We're, talk we're, we're never talking about fault. We're only talking about things that you can add. Because the, the reaction of the entire class was extraordinarily favorable to what you did. So carry that away, please. Thank you. We talked a little about events, right? Do you understand what, he, what I mean by events? Changes in the relationship? Make sure one of the important things is to guarantee the event will occur. And in the rehearsal, you must guarantee that it occurs. And the only way that I know of that you can guarantee that the event will occur is to find a way to physicalize it. Yes, ma'am. In the audition, if you have an, another actor who doesn't really want to physicalize, it sort of makes you look like you're fighting too hard for no, what you want. No, no, no. I can physicalize all I want, and you can stand still, and it'll work. I'll show you. I'll show you. Do you want to come up here? Is this going to hurt? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh oh. Now, I'm, I'm creating an event. What, what's the event I'm creating? That, that we're having a terrible fight and this marriage is going to end, okay? okay. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have, you're not doing anything. Oh, why? <laughs> you just you don't want me to do anything or you want me to? Well, well if somebody's being choked, is he going to do something? Yes, I'm going to get out of it. Yeah. All right, then he gets out of it. Okay, you don't want it that way. I'm... <laughs> 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 oh, right? Yeah, yeah. I didn't mean to hit that hard. N normally, normally you yeah. just go like that and not even yeah. touch it. And, and, and then you still won't give in. Yeah. Okay. Don't give in. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to do a fucking thing. No, that's true. Sooner or later they will. Uh, yeah. yeah. They'll wake up. <laughs> <laughs>
have to do a thing. Just stand there. You can do anything you want. See no reason to pray for such a wicked man. A wicked man needs prayer more than a good man. God told me that. <laughs> Why do you come climbing through the window? There's perfectly good stairs in this house. I take no chances. <clears throat> the neighborhood sees with nosy busybodies. I prefer a more placid neighborhood myself. That is why I urged my father to move into this house. There's gang shootings every weekend. It makes for a much braver life. My father who art in heaven. I was looking in your basement window last night. You see? A neighborhood of thieves and busybodies. On the one hand, I hear you say that you have to guarantee events to your partner. And on the other hand, you're saying you can go and, and homework them on your own. So let's assume that these guys get their events, come to a rehearsal, and they have never met before. What, what might you expect if, if we don't have events that both people have agreed to prior to doing this? Listen, same? I can make events happen all by myself, and so can you. And you do it in your life all the time, right? If your partner goes along with you, you're home free. If he doesn't, you're okay also. So the most important thing is to guarantee them to yourself. Yes, you must guarantee them yourself. And if your partner goes along with it, it's fine. But if he doesn't, you got it. it's still done, isn't it? Right. So you must find a way to physicalize the event yourself. Because your partner may forget. Okay. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Or you may never get to rehearse with them. So you must guarantee events by yourself. And <coughs> and if your partner's worth anything, he'll respond to it in some way, especially if you make them interfering events, which are the strongest kind. Mm. Then they have to deal with it. So also, you must learn attributing. Have I talked about that? <coughs> no. Nope. Nope. When you have a dead partner, or an uncooperative partner, or a difficult partner, or a partner who is lovely and sweet but confused, you must learn to attribute to the partner things he or she is not doing and react to those. Now, the reason I think this is not dishonest is because we do it in life all the time. We attribute things to people that they are not doing. We even attribute things to them, and they deny doing them, and we still believe they are doing them, right? So why can't we do that in acting? It's the same in life. I had agent friends from New York in, who now operate in Hollywood, and, and they have said to me over and over again, it isn't like New York, where all of us used to get the biggest joy out of finding new people. And he said, here they don't want new people. And I said, why don't they want new people? He said, they're afraid to take a chance. And I thought, what does that mean? So I decided one year to watch every episode of a show called Vegas with Robert Urich. Well, it always, every, every episode was the same. Robert Urich gets up in his underwear, because the ladies want to see Robert Urich in his underwear and his skivvies, and uh, he staggers out of uh, this garage or whatever it is he lives in and has some orange juice, and then a girl comes in a bikini and says, you need it down by the bikini bill. And so <clears throat> he says, oh, shit, and throws a T-shirt on and jumps in his little red car and goes out to an oasis where there are 50 girls in bikinis uh, planting palm trees. And <clears throat> 
then he has a long talk with them about it. And then he, then he gets his little red car and he drives back to the casino. And there are girls uh, selling cigarettes with short skirts on and everything cut down to here. And he has long talks with them about who do you think the crook is and so forth and so forth and so forth. Every week's a fucking same plot, over and over and over again. And, and then I began to watch very carefully. And it was fascinating to me to see him pick people like Stella Stevens, you know, who are <laughs> experienced actresses but never became stars and so forth, playing small roles, but hired because they could guarantee that they would make events happen in this damn eventless writing. The guaranteeing of creating events is the assurance that they can hire you. <clears throat> Granted, all, all other things being splendid. I worked on a play called Jamaica, which starred Lena Horne and Ricardo Montalban. And I discovered that every Wednesday matinee and every Saturday matinee between performances, when everybody in the cast would go out to eat, Lena Horn stayed behind and worked with her trio on stage, singing Stormy Weather and all the songs she had sung all her life, perfecting them, still perfecting them. And I used this as an example to students that the way you achieve casualness on stage is through constant perfection of your technique so that it seems to come effortlessly. But it comes from hard, hard work and discipline. And she, there was never any greater example of that than this, watching Lena Horne do this. I learned I really need to go, to go to extremes, that I really need to let people see who I am and not be afraid to show that. And, it, and it's hard sometimes to really show yourself and show what you're really feeling and not be afraid that it'll be rejected.